So a warm welcome, welcome to HYCM's workshop with myself, Giles Coughlin, every Wednesday, 12.30 to 1.30 UK time. Uh, good to have you here, Brian, Johan, Philip, glad you could make it. Yasser, excellent. Good to see some friendly names and faces here. Just as other folks are signing in, don't forget the normal disclaimer. As we go through the session, the different entries, exits, different um, instruments that we're looking at the whole idea of this is an educational session it's not meant to be a trading advice session uh, and those of you who are regular know exactly how this works um, the main event today we're going to be looking at how to trade the us cpi print i'm just going to put us into a bit of context so we know exactly what's going on in terms of the overall market uh, dynamics and i'm going to be looking at the big picture in terms of the US midterm elections. So what I wanna do is present the US midterm elections, and then in that context, we're gonna see how to trade the US CPI print. So what that should do is give us a really good handle on what's going on. So without further ado, I'm gonna go over to the charts, and what I want to do is, first of all, I just wanna give us a little bit of context we're in. Now, if you don't remember the last Federal Reserve meeting, Jerome Powell said he was going to be conscious about monetary policy lag. What does he mean? Monetary policy lag is this. If you hike interest rates today, you're not going to see the full effect of that in the economy until about three or six months time. So in other words, the impacts of the Federal Reserve's recent rate hikes haven't been felt in the economy. So that lag effect is also why you tend to see stocks rebound even when you've got earnings, jobs, and GDP falling. If you look at these last four really big crises in the US, what you'll notice is that the blotted blue line is the S&P 500. And notice how in the Eisenhower recession, stocks bounced even as company earnings, the US's GDP, even as jobs were falling, yet the S&P 500 gained. Similarly, stagflation of the 1970s, earnings falling, payrolls falling, G GDP falling, but stocks rising. Similarly, 1980s, the same dynamic. The uh, SNL crisis of 1990s, again, same dynamic. Global financial crisis, 2007, 2008, same dynamic. So what you need to be aware of is there's a lag effect in stocks. And that means the Fed, you know, might, signal a pause even as earnings, GDP, payrolls are falling. So if we just take a look at the US GDP, we can see that GDP is starting to track lower. Uh, if we look at the jobs, we can see that jobs as a trend is also starting to track lower. But at some point we are expecting a bounce in stocks. Now, in that context, many people have been pointing out this very interesting seasonal dynamic and I want to show you it now you've got to bear with me in my logic here because I'm not advocating you know just jumping into a trade but I want you to see all the pictures of the jigsaw now if you look at the S&P 500 if we look at that over the last sort of 72 years and let's look at it from the US midterm elections right so going back the midterm elections all the way from 1950 if you look here, uh, where are we? About November. So if we take sort of, no, you know, from the November through to the end of the year, you can see that, you know, S&P 500 stocks have gained 13 out of those 18 times, okay, between 30th of October and 31st of December. If you just take this a little bit closer, let's go from the middle of November to the end of the year. See, US midterms, again, very similar dynamic. And if you just look at the, you know, the, the second week of December, we can see, again, a very similar dynamic. So the dynamic that's in play is that after the US midterm elections, stocks tend to gain, right? That's what a lot of analysts are talking about. Now, if you extend that out further, and let's say instead of looking December, we look to April the following year, what do you notice now? Do you see? With a six months time frame, every single time since the 1950s, after the US midterm elections, the S&P 500 has gained. That doesn't mean you should just go out and buy the S&P 500. What it does mean 
is there's a very strong seasonal pattern. And of course, it's midterm elections, new promises, new changes. Now, as we look at what's expected in the midterm elections, the House is likely to be Republican and the Senate is a toss up, but leaning towards the Republican. But there just has been a bit of a surprise Democrat win. So with the with it with a split house or a double republican house that should be mildly positive for stocks but personally i don't think the picture is really clear enough or sure enough for us to definitively uh, for me anyway to take a position out of the us election they're very uh, difficult to you know foretell exactly what the impact of the election can be you remember that problem with um, uh, president trump when he was elected and everyone thought that would uh, be terrible for stocks and then there was a huge uh, rally in stocks, you know, big, big uh, turnaround. So just be very careful of trading US election results. But just know this, that since 1950, six months time, the S&P 500 has on average been 15% higher. OK, so that tells you a lot. Um, it tells you that there, was be, there will be a strong bias to buy stocks going forward. And if we just take a look now at the S&P 500 and we just zoom out, let's just remind ourselves where we're at. So we had stocks rallying into last week in the hopes that the Fed would maybe pause. That then stocks sold off, but they have found some support around that 3700 region. And, you know, we had the initial kind of enthusiasm in selling, but that was quickly found dip buying. Uh, and it wasn't like a big move lower. Now, we're right in the middle of the range, so clearly the market is trying to decide. The bias, as it were, in a sense, is tilted to the downside. But um, we have to be very careful what the US midterm election is going to, results going to be. But this next direction is likely to be dominated by the US CPI print that's coming tomorrow. Well, folks. So there is an element of kind of uh, nervousness, just caginess, because the US election is maybe a little bit more hotly contested than people thought. Uh, and there is isn't an obvious trade out of that at the moment. The results are still coming in. But what we want to look for is this is the inflation data. Now, inflation is extremely important for the US. Let's just take a look at some of the inflation prints that we have. Uh, and we can have a look at that. Yeah, if we just look at core inflation. Now, last Federal Reserve meeting, Jerome Powell, in the statement, the statement said that the, the Fed was going to take into a consideration policy lag. That was more dovish and that caused stocks to rally out of the statement. But then immediately sold off as Jerome Powell said there was more work to do in terms of containing inflation and he expected rates to be higher than previously expected. That was very bullish the dollar, bearish stocks. And this is why. Do you see core inflation just getting higher, higher and higher? So even though headline inflation is, uh, you know, not as bad uh, as perhaps, um, you know, it could be. Headline inflation is sort of, you know, just tracking a little bit like core inflation is picking up. Now, in that context, we now see what we have. So for this print tomorrow, 1.30 UK time, what we're expecting is the headline inflation to year on year fall from 6.6, sorry, not the, head, the headline to fall from 8.2 to 8%, and the core inflation to fall from 6.6 .6 to 6.5. So this is expected to drop from 6.6 down to 6.5, up in line with sort of, you know, February, March highs. That would be a positive result. Now, the market's been sort of pricing that in. And you can see over the last, you know, few sessions, the weakness that we've been seeing in the dollar. That's been lifting gold. It's been lifting silver. Uh, you just take a look at the dollar here. And you can see the dollar just been tracking lower. I'll just uh, put that screen a little bit lower. See, dollar's been tracking lower pretty much all this week in expectations of a slightly softer CPI print. That in turn has been lifting the majors. The weak dollar's also been lifting gold, lifting silver, and reopening hopes have been from you know China. Although sort of hopes have been dashed, they have been helping. Um, the outlook for 
at copper as well recently. So what we're looking for here, this is we've got the context now. Now there's the nice thing about this trade is a surprise either way will be tra will be tradable. So let's do the scenario one. Scenario one, inflation comes in higher. So higher than expected will be the headline above 8.2 and the core above 6.7. So if the headline's above 8.2 and the core's above 6.7, that will mean the Federal Reserve have to keep on hiking interest rates because inflation is high. So that will mean a turnaround in the dollar. So we would expect to see immediate dollar index upside and immediate euro US dollar and pound US dollar selling. I would favor pound US dollar selling after the Bank of England met last week and said they're going to be less dovish, uh, more, more dovish rather, less hawkish than the market was expecting. So if we get a big surprise to the upside, that would be dollar index longs, euro, euro, euro US dollar downside, and or pound US dollar downside. My preference would be pound US dollar downside, just using that 1.1600, looking for a play down to that 1.1200 handle. That would make sense on the pound. Now, let's now look at the opposite. Uh, and in terms of stocks, you'd, you'd expect stocks to fall. So you'd be selling the S&P 500 because higher interest rates, higher inflation, less conducive environment for stocks. That would be the near-term reaction. Now, by contrast, let's say we had the inflation print that came in um, very, very low. So very low would be below 6.3% and below 7.6% of the headline. Now, even better, you know, if it got below 6%, that would be a beautiful opportunity. And below 7.5% for the headline would be a beautiful opportunity. And I'll immediately go long gold, long silver. I go long S&P 500 and I would also anticipate dollar weakness. So I would look at trading something like euro, euro, dollar to the upside. So that would be a good opportunity as well. OK, if it's just kind of below, if it's on consensus, there won't necessarily be a trade because markets been pricing in lower inflation. At the same time, we've got jobless claims coming out. So what we want to see is ideally the jobless claims supporting the inflation print. So what would that be? That would mean if we had a really high inflation print, you know, 8.2% plus 6.7% plus for the headline of the core, and then we saw more, oh, yeah, let's say we saw less jobless claims. So less people are out of work then that would mean the Fed can continue being really aggressive hiking interest rates. So that would be the best opportunity. If this is 8.2 plus, this is 6.7% for the core, and then initial jobless claims, we want to see them lower, below 215,000, continuing below 1,400,000. That would really support dollar strength. If on the other hand, we saw a big miss, below 7.6, below 6.3 for the headline, and then initial jobless claims are much higher, say above 230,000 and continuing jobless claims are above 1,500,000, then that means the Fed's more likely to pause. So that would be supportive for stocks moving higher. So that is the tradable opportunity of the week. It's gonna be the best one of the week. And then we have a series of Fed speakers. So watch out for Fed speakers responding to the latest inflation print. Um, I hope that's clear. That is basically what we need to look for. Um, I don't think there's anything else extra to say. The only thing that I would close by saying is don't forget this seasonal pattern. Now, if you look at this seasonal pattern from, say, December after the last Fed's Fed me, if you just push this a little bit later in the year, we've got the Fed meeting and at the start of December. So let's say we take this from like, up, definitely after the Fed's net, you can see again, there's a really strong pattern. So if we saw a dovish Fed at the next meeting, that could be a good catalyst for gains into the first and second quarter of next year. So just bear that in mind. Now I'm not saying to blindly trade this, of course, 
But do keep it in context. It has been every time since the 1950s. And analysts are right to point it out. Um, and it would be foolish to ignore that. So just know that the market has a bias to buy stocks. Those who say it's different say we've got high inflation, cost of living crisis, um, you know, stocks are trading at really high price to earnings ratio. It's not logical then there could be another down leg. Yeah, that's all true and good, but probably take our um, moves from what the Fed does. Because remember, don't get caught out. Because remember, like some people will be saying, look, you know, we shouldn't be buying this rally because earnings are falling, GDP is falling, um, uh, payroll jobs are falling, you know, so we shouldn't be buying stocks. But actually notice that stocks are forward looking. So you tend to see a bounce in stocks before you see a corresponding bounce in payrolls, in the earnings and in the GDP. OK, folks. Short and sweet, but it has been to the point. So I hope that has been helpful. Um, expect a choppy day to day in stocks as the rest of the um, results come in for the US midterm elections. It could be a bitty um, results day and it may not be finally resolved by the end of the day either. So just look out for choppy action. So the best opportunity, wait, hold fire until the CPI print and look for a beat to the upside or the downside. Folks, I hope that's been helpful. Uh, short and sweet, but to the point, uh, all, filler, uh, all killer, no filler. So I hope that's been helpful. And do come back and join me on the webinar on Monday, and we'll get ready for next week's um, trading as well. Okay, folks, thank you all very much. Take care and have a very good afternoon. Yeah, thank you, Philip. That's great. Thanks to you, Anne. Yes, sir. Manamali, Brian, take care, everyone. Look after yourselves. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye.